Hi everyone, welcome to this class on getting started in astrophotography. So during the course of this presentation I'll be covering a whole range of different uh, bits of information with regard to getting started in amateur astronomy and astrophotography. So just giving you some guidance and pointers on a whole different range of issues from telescopes to cameras, uh, software, organisations that you can join uh, and online resources as well that you, that you can use for educational and learning purposes and many other different things in between. And amateur astronomy today is a very rewarding pursuit and a very accessible pursuit compared to what it was like say 20-30 years ago where getting into it was much more difficult. Today we, we live in a much more open and accessible environment, equipment is easily available. So hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll have a good idea if you're thinking about getting involved in astronomy or astrophotography in how to go about doing it uh, and some of the things that you need to consider. So as I say uh, I've covered a few points there but there are some other more specific areas that are worth mentioning right at the start. So it's worth considering what you want to accomplish uh, with astrophotography or amateur astronomy etc. Are you just doing it for casual pleasure or do you want something a bit more serious out of it? Um, one of the good things about amateur astronomy is it's one of the few remaining sciences where amateurs can actually still make a significant contribution to science in, in several different areas. So, so that is one thing worth considering for those with a more serious interest. Now generally for those that get involved in amateur astronomy tend to specialise in one particular area or another. So for example with myself I've always primarily focused on uh, photographing and observing the planets but of course there are a whole plethora of different areas that you can go into and for example you can go into deep sky, long exposure astrophotography, uh, photographing galaxies, nebulae etc or perhaps photometry, uh, exoplanet photometry, things like that all kinds of different things that, that, that you can go into. I'll also be covering a bit about choosing a suitable telescope and choosing suitable photographic equipment uh, as these days there is a a vast range of both telescopes and cameras available today and it can be a real minefield for the uh, particularly for those starting out to, to try and choose something suitable. Of course there are also a what there's also a wide range of astronomical software both in web resources and programs that you can purchase uh, and freeware as well so I'll go over uh, some of that. Also as with anything there are uh, various pitfalls that you'll need to try and avoid and of course organisations and clubs uh, that are available for amateurs to uh, participate in. So just a brief introduction on myself. Uh, I've been doing serious astrophotography now for uh, well over 20 years and I've, as already mentioned I've primarily focused on uh, solar system objects, particularly the planets and, and comets. I've also uh, made contributions to various long-term studies on, on planetary atmospheres such as Jupiter and Saturn and Mars in particular. I've also had the opportunity to lecture uh, widely over, over the past 20 years uh, and I also have been fortunate to have a wide variety of, of experience from using beginner equipment right up to professional level uh, telescopes and I've also been fortunate to have the opportunity to, to observe from many different uh, locations around the world so uh, over the years I've had uh, quite a, an active and, and varied career and you, you can see more of my work at my website at damianpeach.com and uh, there's just a, a quick shot of the home page there. But just to go uh, back to the beginnings of astrophotography and 
just to give you a brief overview of the of the subject uh, for example for many many decades astrophotography was done with photographic film and you can see here I've got some examples of photographic film images taken with large aperture telescopes and of course obtaining images like this was really painstaking work uh, required a great deal of skill and dedication uh, to obtain results like this using photographic film as it really was a, a, a woefully inadequate tool uh, for capturing celestial objects co compared to the technology we have available today and really as even as late as the mid 1990s still the, the the majority of of amateur work was being done with photographic film and telescopes back then were also generally quite unwieldy and you can see a, a telescope here which more resembles the gun of a battleship than what you'd expect to find in someone's backyard and and telescopes like this were not uncommon for serious amateurs uh, during the photographic era but fortunately bo both cameras and, and telescopes have become considerably more user-friendly uh, since those times now from about 1995 onwards is when uh, a device called uh, the ccd charged couple device uh, came into uh, existence and this was the beginning of the digital era of astrophotography and indeed conventional photography as well and it really completely transformed astrophotography and not just for amateurs but professionals as well and it also had the added benefit of making it ultimately much more affordable and accessible um, gone were those uh, days of, uh, of painstaking hours of guiding with, with photographic film to, to get a, uh, a good photo. We could now see results instantly uh, with devices that were far more sensitive than photographic film. Of course we also have a massive range of equipment available today compared to 20 years ago. Uh, it, it really has, it, it's quite remarkable um, the, the range of equipment that is available today in terms of cameras and telescopes for, for amateurs. Um, we, we've really never been more spoiled for choice. And of course today, we, uh, because of technological advances, we also have really advanced equipment features as well, of, uh, some of which I'll mention later on. And because of, uh, of course, the internet, we now have a wide range of accessible learning material available. So, as you can see, it's, it's really never been a better time uh, if you've been thinking about getting involved in amateur astronomy or astrophotography to, to give it a try. Uh, it has never been easier to, uh, to make that move and, and see how you get on with it. So, just to move on to our next section, choosing a suitable telescope, and this is obviously a, a big decision for, for many and one that requires some consideration uh, because it can involve spending a, a fair sum of money uh, at times uh, and there are various things that are really worth considering when it comes to choosing a telescope so typically the most popular types of telescope you have available are newtonians uh, refractors and schmidt cassegrains uh, as i say these are typically the, by far and away the most popular types for amateurs now for beginners, uh, a refractor is by far and away the best choice uh, because it just can work really well, literally straight out of the box with minimum calibration. For those with a little bit more experience, the schmidt cassegrains and Newtonians will, would be a better choice as, as you can buy much larger apertures uh, at affordable prices. Another thing that's needs to be seriously considered when buying a telescope is your personal situation and you should really buy something that you can use easily and frequently uh, as this will maintain your enthusiasm to observe um, for example if you have a really large and wieldy telescope that's a pain to get out each time and set up it, it, the, the enthusiasm will, will soon wane and it will just end up sat there unused so con consider uh, your your situation and uh, you know your experience level it's better to have something smaller that you use more frequently than something huge that just gets used 
uh, very infrequently. For long exposure astrophotography, so particularly for those doing uh, exposures of galaxies and nebulae, you will need a driven equatorial mount. Um, this is a really essential piece of equipment if you want to do this kind of work. And as I mentioned a, a few points back with SCTs and Newtonians, some telescopes require things like collimation of the optical components, which is extremely important for Newtonians and schmidt cassegrains uh, to get them performing uh, to their true potential. So you can see there are various points that need to be considered uh, when it comes to choosing a suitable telescope. So I'm just going to give you a, a few examples of different levels of telescope. And you can see here uh, we have a beginner level telescope and this is an 80 millimeter aperture refractor and you can see there it's priced uh, around 200 pounds and, and one particularly nice feature here you've got a, a, a small lightweight German equatorial mount but it also comes with uh, a right ascension motor drive um, which will allow you to, to start using it quite easily to, to start basic astrophotography with. Um, now, undriven telescopes, obviously, you're extremely limited in what you can do uh, because they're not tracking the night sky as, it's, uh, as it appears to move. But with uh, a telescope such as this, will we'll give you the opportunity to get started in astrophotography. And with, with the aperture of 80 millimeters, it's large enough to start showing a good amount of detail on a variety of celestial objects uh, for what is a relatively modest price as well. So if we move up to a more intermediate level telescope, and you can see obviously the price jumps significantly. Here we have uh, an 8-inch eight, uh, an Schmidt Cassegrain on a dual axis driven equatorial go-to mount. And obviously something like this opens up all kinds of opportunities, not just visually but photographically as well. Uh, with go-to, uh, you know you have the ability to find objects that would be extremely difficult to find otherwise it also allows you to do long exposure astrophotography quite easily and on a, on a variety of other tasks and, and a telescope like this could really provide many many years of viewing and imaging uh, enjoyment so as we move up to the next level uh, an advanced level amateur telescope and you can see again the price jumps fairly significantly for equipment at this level but you can see here we've got a larger 11 inch uh, astrograph uh, so this particular telescope is geared specifically for wide field astrophotography but it's also on a very high quality go-to German equatorial mount and a mount like this offers very accurate pointing and tracking uh, which makes astro, particularly long exposure astrophotography, much easier than with lower cost mounts. And something like this, you know, gives you the opportunity to do, to do all kinds of work uh, and you know start taking some really impressive uh, astro images. So, no telescope is complete uh, as it comes. You're always going to need additional bits of equipment uh, with any telescope you buy, even really expensive ones. And there are various accessories that are well worth considering, uh, almost for, for any telescope. And I've just listed uh, uh, some of them here. So for example, a motorized focuser is really one of the best accessories you could buy for any telescope. And this basically allows you to focus the telescope without having to physically touch it. And I would, or I would probably go as far to say is it's an essential piece of equipment if you're looking to do serious astrophotography. Uh, it just makes uh, the, the process of focusing so much easier than, than simply using a manual focus knob. Now you can get a, a smartphone holder to allow you to start using uh, your smartphone for uh, some astrophotography. And of course many modern smartphones today uh, offer very impressive levels of photographic performance and features uh, and you can actually get some surprisingly good results with, with uh, modern smartphones. A Barlow lens for those looking to do uh, high power observations of the moon and planets that is, is, is essential. 
Um, since unfortunately many of us live in light polluted areas, uh, a light pollution filter is, is well worth getting for those looking to do uh, long exposure work. Uh, also worth looking into is uh, a set of eyepieces and uh, colour filters which are extremely useful for visual observing and also astrophotography as well. And of course one thing you, you will need and it's probably one of the most basic accessories but many many times I've seen people uh, not not really considering this uh, and that's a dew shield uh, a very important piece of basic equipment that you will need for uh, many types of telescopes particularly Schmidt Cassegrains where in a cold damp climate like, like you have in the UK dew is always a problem uh, particularly during winter so you really will need a, a dew shield for for most types of telescopes. Now just to move on from telescopes to cameras for astrophotography and as I mentioned at the beginning um, we, we're literally spoilt for choice with cameras and there have never been more cameras available for astrophotography than there are at the present time and it really the number just seems to become more and more uh, year on year um, with, with more sensitive uh, chips in cameras and, and all manner of different features being built in, into them so they're becoming more impressive year on year. Now there are various things of course you need to consider when it comes to choosing cameras for, for astrophotography. As I mentioned there's a wide range of affordable cameras available and as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this presentation, you can often buy cameras that are geared towards specific areas of astrophotography. So for example, if you're looking to do deep sky, there, there are cameras more suited to that. If you're looking to do planetary observing, there are cameras that are better suited to, to that task. Now, if you're just looking for something uh, as an all-rounder um, to, to use, then without doubt the best buy it is a digital SLR as they're so versatile in what they can do um, and you can literally use a digital SLR for almost any form of uh, astrophotography and of course they're very easy to use and they can be very easily attached to pretty much any telescope with, with a simple adapter so for those just looking for uh, you know to, to get one camera I'd recommend a digital SLR if, you, if you're kind of looking for just a, a solitary single camera for astrophotography. But if you're looking to focus on more specific areas of the subject, there, there are better choices. So for lunar and planetary imaging, uh, you can get low-cost, high-speed video imaging cameras that operate via um, a high-speed USB interface, and they allow imaging and recording of the planets uh, at very high frame rates uh, which is how uh, modern planetary imaging is done. Now for long exposure astrophotography uh, the ultimate choice is really uh, dedicated uh, CCD, uh, cool, dedicated cooled CCD cameras uh, which, are, which by far and away provide the best results for long exposure deep sky work. So you've kind of got a choice of roughly three different types of camera depending on what you want to do. I'm just going to talk a bit more about each different type of camera. So for digital SLR cameras, uh, as I mentioned, they're extremely versatile and you, you can literally use them for almost any purpose. You've got entry-level models that are, uh, you know, a, a relatively modest price and can give really quite impressive images as well um, you know there are more and more features being built into SLRs year on year as I said they're all very easy to attach to almost any telescope via a simple adapter I would say that they are probably better suited to work to more long exposure astrophotography work rather than uh, planetary although you know, um, SLRs do have good video modes these days. Uh, the, the kind of heavy bulky size and weight of them can, ma can make them a bit troublesome for, for planetary. 
I would kind of describe the digital SLR as really kind of a jack of all trades, but it's not really the master of, of any of them. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a great all-round choice for for pretty much any form of astrophotography. And you can just see a, a shot here that I took of uh, Comet Homes using a low-cost digital SLR uh, some time back. Uh, with a with a small 80 millimeter telescope and, and you can see that just a, a very simple setup like this can actually start providing some some really nice results now for those looking to observe an image of the planets we need to be looking at uh, dedicated high-speed video imaging cameras uh, and there's a wide selection of these available from various manufacturers and one of the great things is about this particular area of astrophotography is it's very low cost compared to more advanced deep sky imaging. So you can easily buy cameras like this for a couple of hundred pounds. Um, and basically they connect to a computer and operate via USB uh, and you record video sequences using these small cameras which basically slot in where the eyepiece would go. Now they offer high speed video imaging at over 100 frames per second. Uh, as I mentioned, they're best, best suited to imaging the sun, moon and planets. And they're also available in either one shot color or mono. Uh, so you, you can start imaging in color straight off uh, with, with one of the uh, color cameras. As mentioned, they're operated via the USB connection. And the software used to run them is actually available for free download, so that, that's very easy to get hold of. Now, if you're looking to shoot the planets, this is by far and away the best type of camera to, to be choosing for that purpose. It's these kind of cameras that all serious planetary observers use worldwide uh, today. There's also a myriad of free software available, both for capturing and running the cameras as well as processing the images from them which is which is it just makes it even easier to get into and some of these cameras can actually be used for um, some forms of deep sky imaging uh, so these are these are well worth looking at for those looking to do serious planetary observing and you can see here just a selection of my own images taken with one of these high speed video cameras attached to a 14 inch telescope and you can see that you know these cameras can with experience good conditions give give extremely good results on on planetary targets now for those looking to do more serious deep sky imaging uh, beyond perhaps what digital slrs offer you need to be looking at a dedicated uh, long exposure deep sky ccd uh, or cmos imaging camera and you can just see a couple of them pictured here. Now these offer the top level of image quality for long exposure imaging um, and they're also uh, cooled as well uh, to reduce uh, dark current noise in the images uh, and these generally give by far and away the cleanest images for, for this type of work. They're much more, generally much more complex to use than digital SLRs. They're also, many of the models are also quite expensive as well. And you can easily be looking at a four figure sum for one of the better models uh, of these types of cameras. But as I mentioned, if you're a really hardcore enthusiast of uh, nebulae and galaxies, th this is the type of camera that you really need to be looking at. And you can see here an image that I shot using a dedicated uh, deep sky camera uh, attached to a large telescope. Um, this is about 60 minutes worth of exposure on the, on the spiral galaxy NGC 1232. And you can see that it, it really offers a, a, a wonderful uh, level of performance when it comes to imaging uh, distant nebulae and galaxies. Now, just to move on, uh, from telescopes and software, uh, from telescopes and cameras. We're going to move on to uh, talking about software available. And there are various types of software available for various different astronomical uh, purposes. So if we move on to planning observations, and of course planning 
observations uh, and planning imaging and photographic observing is really important um, you know particularly uh, if, if you want to get good results pl planning is is a key element uh, in, a, in obtaining good images and a, and a really good planetarium software package I think is probably an essential purchase for any uh, any person interested in either visually or uh, e either visually observing or doing astrophotography. Fortunately today there are a wide variety of different programs available and you can see there I've listed several some available uh, for free download others uh, available for purchase but you can see just a quick uh, screenshot of one of them there and it, it gives you an example of the kind of planning that you're able to do and they're especially useful for you know for example planning time dependent observations perhaps comets or asteroids things like that uh, very very useful for for planning uh, things like that and you can also overlay the fields of view of your equipment to, to get an idea of how to frame objects properly and all manner of, of, of different things you can also get more specific packages so you can see there I've noted a couple uh, virtual moon atlas which is a, a free program you can download for uh, planning lunar observations and also another piece of software that's particularly useful for uh, planetary observing uh, a program called WinDupos uh, which, which is really useful both for planetary uh, processing and planning of observations and one of the great things today is that there are also a variety of smartphone apps available uh, which is a great way for the novice to, to start learning their way around the night sky there are many different apps available uh, for modern smartphones that you can easily download and, and they really uh, work some of them work extremely well uh, and uh, well worth looking at and it's a great way to, to kind of uh, start learning your way around uh, the night sky so just to move on to different uh, software packages for camera control and image processing so for a camera control and operation you can see I've listed a variety of different programs there things such as uh, Maxim DL are, are very popular among serious deep sky observers uh, for planetary things like fire capture and sharp cap uh, are by far and away the most popular programs for camera control and of course for image processing you have a wide variety of different software uh, things like Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom deep sky stacker is is a freely available program online for, for uh, stacking deep sky images and auto stacker and reggie stacks are worth mentioning as free programs available uh, for processing planetary images so there's a variety of both freeware and paid software available in both camera control image processing and also planetarium software so you've got a wide variety of different software packages available uh, for various issues and, and tasks within the field of, of amateur astronomy now just to, to move on to discuss clubs and societies uh, and here in the UK amateur astronomy is, has really never been more popular than it is today uh, which, which is really great to see and there are a variety of both national and international organizations available uh, here in the UK we've got the British Astronomical Association and the Royal Astronomical Society uh, these are by far and away the two major organizations within the UK but we're also fortunate here in the UK to have over 200 local clubs and societies uh, scattered around the country and joining a local club or society is a really great way uh, to get involved uh, in amateur astronomy and indeed it's one of the first things I did many many years ago as uh, as a young lad um, in my in my early teens uh, and I vividly remember attending uh, these these meetings and as I say they're a great way to, to meet like-minded individuals uh, see interesting presentations uh, use club uh, telescopes and equipment and as I say it's a, it's a really great way to uh, to get involved in the subject and you'll no doubt find the vast majority of clubs and societies out there are very very welcoming 
to, to new members. Now, just to move on to discuss online resources, and of course, with the uh, with the internet, um, we have a massive range of different resources available to us uh, that can help make our lives easier when it comes to observing uh, and imaging. So, to begin with, uh, one thing we all have to tackle uh, from observing here on the, on the surface of the Earth is the weather, and weather forecasting is uh, an important issue and of course you can watch tv weather forecasts but online there are some really good tools for uh, weather forecasting and you can see here uh, i've listed one which is probably the the best forecasting tool available in my view at windy.com uh, and that allows you not only to look at detailed forecast models but also live satellite imagery uh, of the entire earth uh, which is updated frequently uh, and this website is really really useful for forecasting and viewing satellite imagery regardless of where you are in the world um, it has a global coverage so very very useful tool uh, for weather forecasting for those located here in the uk of course the met office is the primary body for uh, weather forecasting and its website offers uh, detailed and frequently updated satellite imagery of the UK as you can see there and also uh, frequently updated forecasts of, of weather um, over the course of several days and these two sites uh, are the ones that I primarily use from for observing here at home and it's worth keeping an eye on weather forecasts because there are certain times when uh, you're more likely to get good conditions for observing. For example, when you get big high pressure systems settle in over the country, these generally bring the most steady uh, and usually clear skies, aside from uh, winter time when it can often often be cloudy here, here in the UK. But, but in general, it's those big high pressure systems that often produce the best weather conditions for astronomy. So, moving on to other resources online. Now, of course, there's a wide variety of astronomical news websites uh, available today, uh, and I'll just mention a few here, which are particularly worthwhile. Uh, Space.com, which has been running for, for a long time now, uh, is frequently updated with all, all the latest uh, space and astronomical news stories. Uh, so well worth checking that out at space.com. Another really good site is uh, Universe Today. And again, uh, frequently updated with, with all the latest uh, space and astronomy news. Uh, and of course, spaceweather.com is another really worthwhile uh, website. Uh, for, for looking at, particularly with, with regard to solar activity such as sunspots and auroral activity etc. It's, it's particularly good for that. Uh, so, so those three sites are especially uh, worthwhile checking out for astronomical news uh, online. Now with astronomy it being still although certainly far more popular than it's ever been it's still a, most would consider it a fairly niche interest we're quite fortunate in that we have uh, a variety of of nice ma magazines available uh, which are published uh, around the world and you can see here the the primary ones uh, astronomy magazine uh, which has been running many years uh, published from the united states uh, we also have Sky at Night magazine here in the UK and Astronomy Now here in the UK and Sky and Telescope magazine for, from the USA. So these four magazines are really uh, the primary astronomy magazines available uh, today. And all four of them are, have been running many years, uh, particularly uh, Astronomy and, and Sky and Telescope, which date back uh, some decades now. And all are worth uh, checking out uh, and all feature a variety of astronomical content from professional astronomy news, uh, 
articles written by amateurs and astrophotographers as, as well as equipment reviews and, and all kinds of things that, that would interest anyone with a keen interest in uh, astronomy. Now another really good aspect of, of the internet is of course that we have a huge variety of astronomical learning resources available online today. And I kind of think back to when I started out in astronomy um, as, as, a, as a child and literally the only way you could learn back then was by reading books and uh, the occasional magazine that, that I'd managed to get hold of. But of course things have become considerably easier since those times and, and today we're uh, really spoiled for all of the information that we have accessible literally at the touch of a button. So as I mentioned there's a wide array of resources available online today and social media, things like Facebook and Twitter etc are, are probably among the primary uh, active areas for amateur astronomy today. Um, vast numbers of active groups and amateur astronomers and astronomical organizations both uh, amateur and professional are active on social media so uh, as I mentioned there uh, you can see with Facebook and Twitter the, uh, there are lots of things you can uh, get involved in there are many astrophotography and astronomy groups available on Facebook that have large membership and many experienced members are, are you know parts of these groups as well so a real wide range of, of experience levels and of course with Twitter as well it's, it, this is also a great resource for both astronomical news and active astronomers and observers uh, and also I should say uh, professional space missions as well pretty much all of them post uh, their material uh, live on social media so social media has really become a, a major factor uh, with, with astronomical content today, uh, both amateur and professional. Now there are also independent astrophotography and astronomy forums, uh, a couple of those I've mentioned there, Cloudy Nights and Stargazers Lounge, uh, which are kind of more dedicated communities uh, for amateur astronomy and astrophotography. And of course YouTube has a countless selection of videos uh, on all areas of amateur astronomy and astrophotography but of course with such an open environment you need to be a bit mindful of the quality of some of the material on offer um, it's not all uh, being produced by people of, of uh, high experience levels so, so that is something to bear in mind and of course we also have privately run astrophotography and image processing web pages available and I myself run a, uh, a private uh, page for just that uh, where I have a, a vast range of tutorial videos and material available uh, also equipment reviews and uh, image data sets to practice processing techniques I also of, offer one-to-one -one advice and guidance uh, and of course with a great amount of experience in the field and there are other uh, tutorials sites available too uh, online so it, for those with a more serious interest looking for uh, high quality information I'd really recommend looking at uh, sites such as uh, such as this which um, which I've been running for a, a few years now and has proven really really popular so just to move on to another different area of uh, amateur astronomy and astrophotography and this is something that's uh, kind of started to become increasingly popular particularly over the last five or six years and that is literally being able to reserve, uh, observe an image remotely um, so when I say that you basically log on to a telescope located uh, at a dark observatory location in another country somewhere and you can log on and use that telescope to take astro images yourself 
and then download the images off the telescope pretty much live as they come in and, and then process them and you can see here just a photograph of uh, one of the most popular online remote observing facilities and these facilities are, are, are really I would go as far to say revolutionizing amateur astronomy and how serious amateurs observe today uh, with remote telescopes accessible uh, high quality observatory locations you know likely far better than what you'd find in your own back garden uh, for most people it allows people access to high level equipment at top quality locations now of course it, it, it's not everyone's cup of tea it doesn't give you the experience of being outside looking through a telescope etc but for those perhaps more dedicated to particularly scientific research or dedicated observing programs remote observing is really really worth looking at and today we have a, a selection of providers online uh, chili scope offer access to a top quality equipment uh, up to one meter in aperture and all of the telescopes are of course uh, sighted at a high quality mountain site in the Atacama Desert in Chile under the darkest nighttime skies you can imagine. iTelescope is perhaps one of the oldest names in the field and also has a selection of observatories both in the northern and southern hemisphere so you have sites in New Mexico USA uh, siding spring Australia etc so access to both northern and southern hemispheres slu.com is much the same and telescope live offers a wide variety of telescopes at, at different sites as well so we Today you've got a, a variety of different providers of remote observatories available for, for rent. And basically the, these are rented uh, a given rate per hour. And one thing I would say is that remote observing isn't cheap. So if you're looking you know, to do long exposure work, then... Uh, remote observing may may not be a practical solution because it can you know you can easily spend one to two hundred dollars per hour on some of these telescopes so it, it is not cheap but of course what it does offer you is telescopes and high level equipment at top quality locations now just to move on to uh, astrophotographers uh, such as myself um, just to provide links to some of the, the best known names worldwide in the field and I've just uh, made a short list of some of them the most experienced and well-known figures in worldwide astrophotography today and uh, links to their various websites so these guys are really worth looking at and uh, they offer a variety of, uh, of different types of astrophotography um, from down at the bottom there Yuri Beletsky who takes uh, the most impressive spectacular nightscape images of the Milky Way arching across beautiful landscapes um, to others such as Adam Block who takes remarkable images of galaxies and nebulae and, and Anthony Wesley who takes really uh, impressive images uh, of the planets so you have a wide variety of experienced astrophotographers there and it's well worth just having a good look at their websites to give you an idea of uh, what top quality astrophotography is is possible today now just as a slight sidetrack for this particular presentation um, because we're recording this uh, in early December uh, 2020 and we have an exceptionally rare astronomical event uh, about to take place which I want to just talk a little bit about and that is the extremely close conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that will occur on the 21st of December and the planets will be extremely close together in the night sky um, just one-fifth the apparent diameter of the full moon apart 
so very very close together and as you can see it's actually the closest they will have been to each other in the night sky since way back in 1623 so it's really worth getting out to to try and see this event and as you can see there i've noted the angular separation of them is just six arc minutes which is really really close and even in the vast majority of telescopes you will be able to see both planets within the same field of view uh, which should prove a really uh, a really quite memorable and impressive sight now both planets are unfortunately fairly low in the evening sky uh, as seen from the northern hemisphere so the, the after sunset they'll be fairly low down in the twilight sky but should be fairly easy to pick up around 30 minutes after sunset now as i say it's well worth getting out to to try and see and photograph this as they will not be this close again for many many years uh, and luckily they'll be well placed and very close to each other for a few nights centered on the 21st so it's not just down to that one single night whether at the closest either side of that night on the 22nd and 20th they'll they'll be very close together as well so you can see here just a view of the area uh, down low in the southwest after sunset on the 16th and 17th of december and during that time the slender crescent moon will pass by as you can see uh, being just below the pair on the 16th and just alongside them on the 17th and you can see here a view uh, on the 21st at the closest uh, at 1700 ut and you can see we'll uh, actually see all four of the galilean satellites callisto ganymede io and europa all alongside jupiter and as the sky gets a little bit darker you'll also be able to see titan and, and perhaps some of the other saturnian moons so it should be a really really impressive uh, sight to uh, to almost any any observer and i would strongly urge you to to try and get out there and observe this extremely rare event so just to conclude this presentation uh, and to, to go over a few final points it's uh, obviously it's, as I said right at the beginning it's never been easier to get into amateur astronomy and astrophotography um, we really are you know I kind of think back to when I started uh, as a young lad in 1988 and amateur astronomy has really changed beyond all recognition since that time um, it's never been easier and more accessible of course we have a massive range of equipment both telescopes cameras and anything you can imagine available today and and the vast majority of it is is more affordable than it's ever been another great thing is we have now have a global community of active observers that are all in e in rapid and constant contact with one another so there are lots of fields of active interest within amateur astronomy so a wide variety of options for you to, uh, to to get involved in as i've mentioned during the presentation there are numerous resources available online for education and learning for beginners right up to advanced observers and of course many active groups on uh, on social media and, and other forums you also have of course both national and local astronomy groups that are well worth getting involved with yeah, and submitting your work to uh, that can be very uh, a very re rewarding thing to do for those with more serious interest you can also start making uh, contributions to uh, particular scientific programs uh, so there'll be various programs of study that have been active in various observing sections such as the uh, British Astronomical Association has very active observing programs for Jupiter mars and other planets uh, and other objects so well worth getting involved in those as, as your interest grows and of course one thing that's really good and i'm sure many many of you will, will find as you start your journey into astronomy and astrophotography is you'll be hard pressed to find a more helpful and friendly community um, in my experience uh, over the over the many years 
people are always ready to help and advise um, e even those uh, with the most seemingly silly or rudimentary questions uh, we all have to start somewhere and, and you will certainly not find a more helpful and welcoming bunch of people so hopefully this presentation will have given you uh, a good general overview of amateur astronomy and astrophotography today and how to get involved and, and what's available and uh, wishing you good weather for the upcoming close conjunction of Jupiter and Venus uh, Jupiter and Saturn sorry